Here today we have the Asus ZenBook S13 OLED, and Asus was nice enough to not only sponsor this video, but uh, not send us a box. So we got our bananas. Wow, look at that. Thank you Asus for sponsoring this video. First problem with it though, they showed me at CES their super nice ceramic coating that doesn't get you any fingerprints on the back. This one right here, you can see my grubby handprints. That said though, this is a really cool finish. Look at this. Given how nasty my hands are right now, it's doing a pretty good job. And I do have to say, this is a fantastic looking little machine. We've got these nice little, how the heck did they do this? They must have anodized it, bead blasted it, and then machined out these little cutouts, which would not have been a cheap operation. That said though, it does look really good. Asus got back to me about what exactly this lid is made out of. This uses a special process to transform the aluminum lid into a plasma ceramic aluminum that is exclusive to Asus. What that means, I have no idea. I can guarantee you this right here is not a plasma at the moment. You do not want the back of your laptop to be plasma. <laughs> also, uh, it's fully recyclable. Excellent. This thing is so thin. It is 10.9 millimeters thick, which is like five, six millimeters thinner than you'd expect for a device of this size. And with that, I am a little bit concerned. A lot of the time, a company will pursue thinness or something along those lines, and in the process, just kind of forget that they need to make a good device. But we have evidence that Asus has not done that, starting with the iOS. Right here, full-size type A port. Love to see it, don't know how you did it in a device this thin. Also, 3.5 millimeter headphone microphone combo jack. Around the other side, the IO continues to be shockingly good for a device of this size. HDMI 2.1, love to see it, as well as two Thunderbolt 4s, and well, that's it, but it still is pretty darn good. They didn't even have the little flappy chum. Normally with these, you expect there to be a little like thingy there. They didn't even have to do that, dang. Now for the thinness, did they have to sacrifice build quality? Oh, it does a little flippy uppy thing. So if you look here, the hinge goes down so that it lifts up the keyboard just a tiny bit, which I'm guessing helps with thermals. On something this large, I don't care how good of a job you can do with the thermals, you're gonna have problems if it's this small. But if you lift it up, you have nice fresh airflow going in there. Looks like they have a bunch of heatsink all along the back here. Maybe it'll actually be good. Is it floppy? There's a tiny bit of flex around the keyboard. But as far as I can tell, it's all just sort of macro chassis flexing, which is for the most part, okay. What's a real problem is if there's like a soft spot, but I don't feel anything that isn't just the entire chassis moving. Also, look at the size of this trackpad. Given the size of this thing, they have used up all the space they could get. I really appreciate that I'm able to put my hands on here have them on the home row and I'm not falling off the back. On a lot of 13 inch devices, they will super aggressively remove like the bezels here, the bezels down here. Asus has been kind of bad for this in the past and you're just left with no room for a trackpad or a palm rest. But here they have done a fantastic job. I can actually put my hands on here and it's all good. And also the trackpad has had its size increased by nine and a half percent. Look at how big it is for the size of this thing. I don't know why, but we have a very small manatee in our search box. Can you can you see that, David? I don't know why, but I like it. Thank you, Windows. <laughs> we forgot to look at the power brick. So this right here, USB type C, love to see it. And also this right here is 65 watts. So that's about what you expect with a device of this size. It's pretty small, but also 65 watts isn't a whole lot. So they say what, one kilogram? Shall we test it? Single kg, 2.2 pounds. One kilogram and 50 grams. They have what, one nickel worth of weight extra on here? Maybe we have a more SSD than the one kilogram model. Okay, let's have a look at the keyboard here. Asus's rep said that for the most part, making it this thin and light, they didn't really have to do any compromises. Like they just did it by engineering the shell that the screen goes in a little bit better and shaving off a tiny bit, like just by engineering it well. The one spot that it's a little bit of a trade off though is the keyboard. So you do get less actuation than last gen. I think this is 0.6 millimeters of travel. Fortunately, the keyboard is still fantastic on this. Now, it isn't as good as if it did have an extra half millimeter of travel or so, but they have made the whole thing quite satisfying to use. It is not a whole lot of actuation force, like it is 
quite easy to hit the keys, but they just sort of snap down and it's pretty satisfying. It feels a lot like cherry reds, like the really low profile ones. I could see this being an excellent keyboard if you were a gamer, like you could really, really quickly hit the keys. One of the largest concerns with having really low actuation keyboards is that if the key stability isn't good, you can very easily end up in situations where the key is dipping below the chassis before it actually actuates. But here that isn't a problem. The whole thing is actuating before it's able to sort of slop its way down. It doesn't feel like the key consistency is perfect. Like I feel like R is slightly less forced than E. I would still overall though, give this keyboard an A. So fantastic job. Below that we have the trackpad. Is this glass topped? doesn't look like it. That said though, it does still feel good to use. It doesn't have like fancy force actuators or stuff like that. It is just a very simple click, but at the same time, simple clicks work. <laughs> oh, does it pass the pickup test? Good question. It's all good. You can hold it by the edge, still clicks. In here for the processor, we get the 13th gen Core i7 1355U. So that's two performance cores and eight efficiency. And those performance cores go up to five gigahertz. And a laptop like this, like sure, you only have two performance cores, but you also still have 10 cores in a laptop that you can just toss around like this. For RAM, we have 16 gigabytes of DDR5 running at 6,000 mega transfers per second. It says slots used eight of eight, which means it is almost definitely soldered directly to the board. Although if you want, you can get 32 gigabytes when you buy the laptop. Also for storage, we have a one terabyte NVMe SSD from Micron, Wi-Fi 6E, love to see it. And of course, Intel Iris Xe graphics, which is Fine. Of course, this being the ZenBook S13 OLED, it has an OLED screen and it looks pretty darn good. It is 2080 by 1800, so that's 16 by 10, and it is an OLED panel, which means it just looks fantastic. And part of it looking fantastic is that, uh, yeah, there is no touch screen here, which normally I don't like too much, but on OLED panels, it is extraordinarily easy to screw it up. The subpixels between an LCD display and an OLED display are different. And if you don't perfectly line up the digitizer for the touchscreen, it can make your OLED just look like trash. Here, we do not have to worry about that at all. And this right here looks darn good. Normally I expect on an OLED display to start being able to see the subpixels mm, somewhere around like here. Nah, I'm probably out here. On this, I cannot see anything. Like there is no dirtiness of the gaps between the subpixels or I, I literally cannot focus on the display close enough to see the subpixel. Oh, there we go. That right there is really showing off why OLED is just the absolute king. Especially when combined with the 550 nit peak brightness, like this right here, I don't know, computer generated Pringle just looks absolutely fantastic. Which is good because the OLED screen does of course have its trade-offs, namely battery life, but it would not look as good. Now this having Dolby Atmos means that it should be able to use some sound trickery stuff to make it sound much larger than it actually is. And with sound by Harman Kardon, hopefully it sounds good. Oh, that's pretty good. Not very loud though. The Dolby Atmos of it is very interesting. It sounds very thin when I'm back here, and like it's just from coming from this. Then I move somewhere right around here, it becomes way larger. I wonder. It looks like the speakers are down firing. If we have it on a hard surface. Hmm. I would say those speakers are nifty, <laughs> but not very good. So it's kind of strange because the Dolby Atmos surrounding you only really works when you're closer to the laptop than is comfortable. I would want to be like right here, which sounds fine, but it's way better when I'm actually above it. So here it sounds enveloping. One thing that is really fun about the speakers though is that they vibrate the whole chassis. You get this like tactile experience with the bass instead of actually hearing it. It's, it's a bit on the quiet side for sure, but given how much the whole thing is like jamming, 
I feel like that if they had it any louder, it would just be distortion. One thing that's awesome about OLED displays is that the pixel response time is just so, so fast. Even though this is only 60 Hertz, just ripping around with the gaming mouse feels super responsive in a way that a lot of, particularly on professional devices, you, you just can't get that. It'll feel super gross. So we're here at 1080p medium getting a solid uh, 24 FPS, which does not feel as bad because again, pixel response time's excellent, but I, I don't love it. <laughs> oh dang, this is, this is doing pretty good. So the 24 FPS was actually at 1800p, which is impressive. I am now at 1200p, which is 16 by 10, 1080, and I'm getting a solid 40 FPS, which is honestly a lot faster than I was expecting. So right here is quite playable and I didn't have to completely tank the visuals. Like we have grass and stuff. It's so rare that you get grass when we're on an ultralight. Now uh, we are currently in the standard mode, but let's put it into performance mode. Oh, there's the fans. They were quite quiet before. Now, now they're audible. That has netted us hmm, six FPS or so. This thing is going a lot faster than I was expecting. Like what's our processor at right now? Okay, 2.1, but the <laughs> GPU is getting absolutely hammered. I am shocked how good this is. Good job, Asus. Let's see, I'm gonna knock it down just a tiny bit more. 900p. Solid 60 FPS. This right here is doing shockingly well. I am impressed. This is not a gaming laptop to be very clear, but for something with just a simple iGPU, and given that it's barely over a centimeter thick, dang. Well, we're in the ASUS software. Let's just see what else they have here. So we have AI noise canceling microphone, omnidirectional mode. Hello, I am speaking. This is into the microphone and we are in omnidirectional mode. Uh, can you guys start making a racket? Okay, so they're making a racket. We're now going to unidirectional mode. I wonder if you can tell anything. Back to omnidirectional mode where you can apparently hear everything. Let's see what that was like. All right, we're good. Okay, so they're making a racket. We're now going to unidirectional mode. That's good. I wonder if you can tell anything. It's definitely not perfect. Like you could hear some of the rabbling well, it was in the single presenter mode, but at the same time, it did not bad. And that's a pretty challenging situation. So for our webcam, it is 1080p. I would say that this right here is completely usable. And the microphone is very, very above average. Also alongside the camera, Asus has Windows Hello facial recognition up there, which again, fantastic. Absolutely love to see it. So you don't have to worry about typing in your password or your pin or anything. You can just whoop and you're right in. Okay, so apparently this has adaptive color. So that means that depending on the color temperature of your surroundings, it will change the display. Let's turn that on. Now, I don't know if this is going to show up on the screen recording or not, but I'm going to walk over there and maybe it'll change. That's great, it seems to work. And that's the sort of thing where if you are using this for photo editing, you can just trust that the colors that you see on the display are much closer to what it actually is instead of getting screwed up by ambient light or something like that. In here, we also have options for the display settings. So I really appreciate they have it on normal mode instead of a chipping with vivid, which David described as the colors screaming at your eyes. I agree. We also have true to life, which sounds bad, but it's off by default, so who cares? And oh, more camera stuff. Apparently they do the background blurring stuff and uh, the gaze correction if you wanna be real creepy looking. Okay, light optimization. How does that do? It looks the same, but maybe with a lower frame rate. Um, I cannot tell the difference at all. It almost looks like a smoothing filter. Like I look worse, I think. Okay, so we'll leave that off. <laughs> background blurring, how is this? The background is certainly blurred. And uh, okay, if I move around, I can show it pretty well, but it is doing its job. It's not the most convincing bokeh I've ever seen, that's for sure. Gaze correction, this is gonna be creepy. Uh, so apparently it is correcting my great gaze. I'm going to look over here. Is it, I, I don't know. I, I can't tell if this is working. Motion tracking. It's zooming in, okay, cool. And appearance filter. It kind of just looks like it's a 720p webcam now. Uh, I would probably never use any of that again, but it's there if you want it. <laughs> 
11 T5 screws later and we are in. Now do note, they have longer screws at the back of the device than all of the ones in the front. Don't screw that up or you will have a bad time. Wow, that's a battery right there. <laughs> 63 watt hour battery. I think it is very fair to say that they could not have fit any more in here. For one, it is super thin. This is an incredibly small battery Z depth wise, but it is absolutely massive in every other way. That is comical, I love it. <laughs> now it is unfortunate that they only have OLED screen options because it does hurt your battery life but this right here is going to do as good of a job as you can in something of this size without like having no speakers. Now the cooling system is nothing too special. We have two little incredibly slim fans and two heat pipes, but as we saw in Valheim, it does its job incredibly well. Also we have our RAM, it's soldered down, so you're not gonna be able to replace that yourself, but at the same time, hits 6,000 megatransfer per second. So nice and close to the die right there, excellent. Even though you can't upgrade the RAM, that's uh, all soldered down right here, you can upgrade the SSD right here. Well, overall, I think this ZenBook is a fantastic little machine. They have not fallen for making it terrible in the pursuit of it being exceptionally thin. So huge thanks to Asus for sponsoring this video. You can check them out in the link down below and just have a good old day. See you later.